do 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 Welcome to this Domains 21 session. I am joined today by Katarina Schultz and Christian Fradrich, and they'll be here today talking to us about outside their domain, introducing German higher ed to domain of one's own, which is near and dear to my heart. So please, Katarina and Christian, take it away. Thanks, Jim. Um, we're very happy to be here and talk about our project. And yeah, it's a special occasion for us. Yeah, thanks very much. So what we have planned for, for today for this session is um, we'll kick things off with a short presentation, a couple of slides that uh, Katharina will present uh, and then hope to dive into a more conversational part, um, especially with you, Jim, but of course, um, not um, also with everyone participating and viewing this session. So let me just see if this works now. We've, you should be able to see my screen now, right? Yeah, thank you. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so first off, we have a short presentation about our project. Um, it's just simply called Domain of One's Own because um, actually the concept is not very well known in Germany and that's one of the main goals of our project to make it better known in Germany. And our project is funded by um, the University of Applied Sciences Hamburg, HAW Hamburg, as part of uh, a cooperation of all um, or most Hamburg universities called the Hamburg Open Online University. It all started at uh, an event called OER Camp meets Hacks and Tools. The OER Camps uh, was a series of bar camps uh, funded by the German Ministry of um, Education and Science. And the Hacks and Tools was sort of a workshop where people could bring their OER projects and work with coaches. And it was also um, the opportunity to win funding. And Christian and I were there. It was um, almost exactly a year ago. And we had talked about doing something um, on Domain of One's Own before. And we spontaneously decided to um, pitch for funding. And this is us <laughs> doing the pitch. And yeah, so we were a bit surprised because it was all spontaneous and we actually um, won a little bit of funding by um, Hamburg Open Online University. The project um, has sort of um, the main task or one of the main aims is, as I said, making domain of one's own better known in Germany, but also um, is... Um, when you translate something into German or any other language, you also have to um, to suit it to um, the the country and not only translate it, but also look at the differences and what um, the special what the culture needs. And um, so we are sort of trying to adapt domain of one's own for Germany. So we it, it started off with um, a white paper uh, by EduCourse, Seven Things You Need to Know About Domain of One's Own. And we're trying to adapt this for the German um, culture, for the German higher ed landscape. Yeah, the main goal is to tell people how to do it. So what is it? Because um, as I said, it's not very well known. So we um, want to provide material about um, what the concept uh, entails and but also what they sh should know if they want to try to implement it at their own um, university. And so we're looking at the at the concept from different perspectives, um, pedagogy, didactics, but also um, cultural um, circumstances, organizational aspects, and but also the student's perspective is very important for us. We started out by taking a look at um, the concept through a series of um, conversations, which we recorded in a podcast, and we had different guests from um, 
different fields. Um, we had someone who is um, an expert on uh, open education and works in, um, is, is a professor in the field. But we also, um, we talked with the students and we also talked with people who are more um, in the strategic sector in German higher ed. Apart from the podcast, we are also um, going to develop um, uh, white papers and sort of um, uh, guides or how to's um, that you, so you have a guideline if you want to implement the concept in your um, teaching. What we'd like to talk about now is the challenges that we face, but also um, we um, brought a couple of questions that we could, uh, would like to discuss with people who have experience with um, the concept. And some of the, the challenges we face um, is that um, uh, Germany is um, a largely conservative or it has very conservative traditions, um, the German higher ed landscape, and, but it's also largely publicly funded, which means it's um, traditionally underfunded. And it also has a culture that is um, not very uh, open to change. And yes, so we brought a couple of questions that we um, could discuss. And we would also like to hear from you about um, your experiences and also your success stories. So we, we're hoping there, those are out there. But well, one of the things I wanted to ask as we start this, and uh, I'm pretty interested in is, over the last five or six years, since about 2016, when a, a German contingent came to OER, and I was actually at that conference, there seemed to be a moment in the German higher ed landscape where it's like, OER is something we need to pursue. And I wonder like, how has that developed? And do you see overlap in the work you're doing with the larger push and funding of open educational resources. So I'll start there and then we can address those questions as we move. Part of the reason why, and I was at that conference in 2016 in Edinburgh, um, part of the reason I think why at least more, why more and more take up among the, the German communities in, in around open education was, especially to the OER conference, I think were two things. And on the one hand, there was some funding available with OER info. I think Juran Musmeholz has talked um, a bit about that. And the OER camp, for example, where we pitched this idea and then developed this idea of trying to convert ideas of domain of one's own to the German landscape. Um, that's basically OER, the OER camp. So this, this kind of unconference is financed or was financed by OER Info in, in large parts at least, um, together with the Hamburg University of Applied Sciences. And um, that kind of enabled a more systematic take up of OER and open education principles in the German landscape. Um, in 2016, there was also the um, most recent coalition in, in, in the German government. You all know Angela Merkel probably. And in the coalition papers, it was stated that Germany would try and develop an OER strategy. That hasn't really happened yet. Um, now in the last six or seven, eight months of this, um, of the, of this government being in charge, um, it seems almost like a fig leaf approach to develop a OER strategy now, um, at least from, from what I can tell. Um, but of course, that they, they are starting that and they're starting with uh, conversations around that. And they're, um, I think a week before this airs, we should have more input on how the consultations with different stakeholders went. I think they're scheduled for mid-April, which is also a first. So the, the Ministry of Education doesn't usually consult stakeholders in this kind of official manner when developing strategies. Um, so OER is playing a role 
Um, but OER Info, the the project that I just mentioned, that is kind of supposed to network different actors, um, was um, not continued um, and ended by I think March, no, um, fall in 2020. I see some similarities. Um, I work in the field of open access, so um, um, support for um, research publications, and that's something that um, has also um, there. There have been strategies by the government and by by federal states, and then recently, I read um, that the Green Party um, they have in their um, for the coming elections so one of their claims is that open access should become the standard for um, research publications mm -hmm. and that's exactly the same sentence that has been in strategies for 10 years or, or 15 years mm -hmm. and so um, I th I've um, the same thing seems to be happening with OER strategy so um, it it doesn't really it's not really much happening there there's strategies but um we don't really see a lot of structural change so one of the things i'm interested in is i mean it sounds to me when you frame the the broader public funded fairly conservative because that is public funds and you know the risks you take have a lot of implications more broadly for the nation so i'm wondering how do you see domain of one's own within the context of German higher education? A lot of folks who I who will be talking about it and chatting about it and you'll hear about may use it as a form of a portfolio, an experimental place to kind of narrate your learning over time, places for faculty to share their research. I mean, but in the end, we're talking about a website that you and maybe a community control and build. And it's not limited to one technology, but hopefully gives you access to several. So in the context of the German higher ed landscape, how would that, or how are you positioning that as something where folks would be enticed? Oh, from my experience, um, you have to be a sort of a bit, um, you have to make sure that you don't come across as someone who wants to change everything. Um, because then um, people only think of the challenges and um, all the reasons why it wouldn't work. So um, when you try to explain the idea, most people say, oh, so it's like an e-portfolio, because that's something that um, German universities have been doing. Not all of them, but it's sort of uh, they know about it and they can relate to uh, domains from uh, that um, viewpoint. and. From my experience, I think it's best to try to start small and not um, to uh, yeah try to change the whole landscape of a university. That's that's right. If you come across as the um, flag carrying revolutionary trying to conquer a campus or an IT center at, on a on a campus, you'll be shut out. But um, on the other hand, I think that the very 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 many things of domain of one's own kind of are a great fit to the overall culture and strategy of public universities being publicly funded and i can hear like robin de rosa sigh in the back a bit of about oh, your your higher ed sector is mostly publicly funded um and that given given that domains enables you to claim your space on the public web on on for for everybody to to be able to to access it if if you allow them to if you if you enable that um whatever kind of technology you use i think that's for example a great a great fit and can easily be tagged to different kind of strategic viewpoints that universities and higher ed uh, actors sometimes have on the other hand um what we ran into quite a lot by now is like this we've we've been there before we've done that before kind of feedback so many of you um and i know you jim you m might remember this as well i'm pretty i'm pretty sure you do because i think i stumbled upon a couple of uh, screenshots of, of a couple of like personal html designed websites that faculty and staff at a university had in the 90s 
and I think I'm, I'm not sure maybe somebody can will be able to dig it up or I might be able to find it I think I even saw that in a blog post by you Jim a couple of years ago where you kind of highlighted those HTML based websites that could look kind of freaky um, several of them were German actually and several of them were German we just yeah. we just ran a workshop with the university in Mainz in Germany and Frankfurt. there was one um, oh yeah with uh, <laughs> it, the workshop was based in Frankfurt um, but there was one guy from the university in Mainz or who was based at the university in Mainz at their IT department and he, he was like well I don't know what you're talking about we basically shut down what you're talking about in 2018 so up until that point they had those sites up and running and not many people were able to claim that because it was kind of technologically not as accessible if you this this kind of disconnect and and i think to some extent it even ignores that there's pedagogy there's organizational development evolved there's all these things that might have been ignored when this was run in the 90s basically. yeah i think that's the problem from what um that guy um told us it wasn't they so they just um gave them the space the web space and there was no support there was no there might have been technical support but nobody helped them um and gave them ideas what they could do with it it wasn't uh embedded in um the pedagogy the the teaching and learning so of course it doesn't work the the idea of the 90s web there's a, a Russian net artist, Olia Lialina, who I'm, I'm really interested in. And she just wrote a piece uh, from, from my to me, talking about the changing nature of the web from a kind of my site, my space, my, you know, mm -hmm. uh, GeoCities to me. Look at me. Here I am. And, and how the me is always on another platform that you don't own. And I think that point you're making about these faculty who actually were doing open education, were sharing their courses, were building out resources for students, were running entire courses online in the 90s using HTML, we're really alighting and kind of, in some ways, not only alighting, but full-blown bulldozing a whole infrastructure of uh, the web and open educational resources in place of these platforms, in place of these vendor solutions, in place of you name it. And the point you're making, which is really interesting, because I was on a call recently where there was a school who was arguing we need to get rid of, you know, hundreds of HTML sites on an Apache server because like they're no longer sustainable. And I have this voice in my head from Olia Lialina's recent, you know, article where I'm like, that's a mistake. Like, I don't know if this makes sense to start thinking of the web as a kind of a necessarily singular progress where the idea of building and creating a sense and a presence that you have and that can be consistent and maybe not the brand that the university is going for is important. And I think in some ways that space of a domain of one's own, whether it's to reclaim or wherever, is important because a lot of those faculty have become disempowered with the work that they did for many of them several decades. So it's a really interesting question around how much power do we cede, not only to the big platforms, right, but also even to central IT of the work we've done over time. And I, I think that really puts domains to me in a very interesting place because historically the need for it is there. But uh i think that might be one of the big obstacles in germany actually central it and central uh communication departments who don't really want to give um not only students but also faculty faculty they don't want to give them uh their own domains that's uh, the first thing you hear um at several universities why should we uh should uh, central communication uh, allow students to have their own domain when even we, the faculty, aren't allowed to have it. And um, you talk to central IT and when you're building a, um, a publication server, um, like an institutional repository, um, yeah, but they can put on that server, they can put anything they want. Who, who, who controls the quality? And so... <laughs> That's, I think that's a big obstacle in Germany. 
it's a, a question there, and it came up recently. I think Gardner Campbell blogged just the other day about this idea of how do we and why who why do we have the power to seed so much of the cultural history of an institution and the thinking for faculty for students on these different technologies, whether they're HTML sites from the '90s or say a web a WordPress site that's no longer wanting to be supported by central IT or whatever. How do we give one group that much power to say no or to say goodbye? And this isn't to vilify central IT because they have a lot of real challenges in this changing ecosystem, right? Like they have hard to keep on to their to their um, employees because so much they can make so much money elsewhere. They have to outsource a lot of that to keep up. I mean, there's challenges, at least mm -hmm. if I'm speaking from the U.S. perspective. But at the same time, po politically and policy wise, these decisions are being made unilaterally about a whole history of web-based learning, where I think in this moment during the pandemic, we'd be like, oh, maybe it's important to hold on to a little bit of that long history to understand where we were, where we are, and where we're going. But I find that stuff is just bulldozed, kind of like cities during the 60s as they're getting ready for the next wave of gentrification. It's really crazy. Part of, like I have two thoughts on that, and the first one is is pretty short. I think the the whole job description of the central IT is to be risk averse, uh, and not to and and that kind of that deconstructs lots lots of innovation quite quickly. Actually, I mean to to some extent you just hit a wall because the in the end um, any kind of security, be it copyright wise or anything else like that, might be um in the way or might be might need to be figured out and in that moment it at this moment can say um we're not doing this and that is because um from my experience lots of um higher ed institutions in germany and sometimes elsewhere as well think of it kind of as like the the executing branch kind of like a um not no disrespect but kind of like the janitor of the university when it comes to the digital like you you just do what you're told and you you try not to cost as much you you have to be efficient and effective in what we want you to do but you kind of deliver the bare minimum at least in in germany that's quite often the case and I'm, and i have high respect for the people still doing that job because you have to keep a lot of balls in the air kind of you have to juggle quite a bit you have to outsource you you um need to recruit people who can actually do the work while not being able to pay, pay salaries that would be like industry standard so there's lots of balls in the air and then um then we come along and ask people to hey wouldn't it be a cool idea if like the the first semester students got their own domain when they uh when, when they join our institution and they will just throw their hands in the air and and tell you to leave the room and I can understand how they do that and I think it's a strategic and organizational development challenge then and it's not about IT anymore and, and this is something we've seen I think for for over a decade longer now of IT from the academic mission and at some points they're actually working at cross purposes given mm -hmm. that idea of trying to keep everything controlled and some of the unknowns that come with IT and some of the larger kind of possibilities for you know, what we see in like systemic failure if an application doesn't work. So that push for an enterprise singular application often means they're more concerned about one thing being reliable um, and not about a whole different garden of, you know, various, you know, herbs mm -hmm. and flowers and plants and vegetables that you're growing so that you have a rich kind of well-balanced diet to use a bad metaphor. So it is, I mean, and it's an ongoing struggle. And on the other side, we, we in some ways reclaim hosting, not to use this as a little commercial, but don't ever put it past me, is one of the things that actually happens is we find ourselves in that weird space where mm -hmm. there's IT organizations that can't or won't do it. And there's faculty and students and groups and organizations on campus that need to do it. And so it just fits a need and IT doesn't mind because they don't want to be left holding the bag and they have other things to do. And yet we're kind of situated in that we understand the needs and kind of deal with these applications and these server infrastructures on a regular basis. So it's that kind of strange thing that I always thought I was going to be instructional technologist at a university for life. 
But turns out universities are more interested in getting um, help from a third party, often corporate situation. And in some ways, it's easy, at least in America, to vilify the vendor and, you know, celebrate the university and what could be. And I understand that struggle. But at the same time, the universities are the one who are looking for those alternatives because in, and that's the people who kind of are doing this because internally they're not getting support. Mm-hmm. And so there's a weird struggle there. And I wonder just how you are both working in some ways externally to try and rethink how folks can do it internally. I imagine that presents some real struggles. So what are some of the examples you use? Like when you go, how do you frame it? Like, how do you say, here's what's happening wouldn't you want to allow your students or faculty to do this? I think we're still on the way of figuring this out. So we've looked at, for example, Coventry. Um, And because they kind of have this this great um, intro to what does domains mean on on their website. Um, And I think that's a good example because it kind of enables us to say, well, this was started at least while they were still within uh, in the european union right so any kind of the 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 uk sector at least is perceived sometimes as a bit more comparable to what we have in continent on continental europe so that's one thing the e-portfolio was mentioned before like this this can be a segue into this whole thing and i think it's a classic um but also um linking it to institutional strategies and not maybe even regional strategies like the hamburg open um Hamburg Open Online University does. So claiming that learning and teaching should kind of interact with society as a whole and and making that more strategic, maybe even not as easily graspable argument. But those kinds of segues we've tried out. Also, um, and that's, I think, my last point to this is you can link domain of one's own to something that many people would say is kind of an almost an, an not an not an explicit goal of higher ed education quite quite often but like anything that can be linked to digital literacies or digital um, or, or any any kind of competence framework nobody ever asks a student after university well how are your Moodle skills how are your uh, I don't know LMS skills but if you if you come out of university and you can, I don't know, work with WordPress, you know, PHP, HTML, whatever it is. I wish I had been at a university running this stuff because my life would be much easier now. And I think that goes for lots of other people in their job world, but also in like the their private lives. And one thing uh, you can also start uh, try to uh, connect to when talking about domains is um, there are um, a couple of universities that try to um, do research-based learning. So forschendes Lernen, that's a big thing in Germany. It has a, um, sort of a strong, it has strong advocates in Germany. And um, so that's also where I come from, from the open access um, viewpoint. So trying to link uh, student publishing to domains um, can also work. There, there are projects that try to have students publish um, also as part of their studies. So that that's also something that um, some universities can relate to. I have to say this has been an amazing conversation. I want to thank you both for taking the time to not only promote the good word of Domain of One's Own far and wide in Germany, but also just thinking critically about what it means to do something like this in a different context, culturally, politically, et cetera. It's it's super interesting. And hopefully you'll find not only other people inspired by your work, but also inspired by others so that the virtuous circle can keep on turning. So thank you both for joining us for another great session in Domains 21. Big fan. Thank you. Thanks for making this work. Looking forward to the other sessions. (laughs) Nom nom nom.